you gets you down If you're in the country living And partial to the sky Then come on down to Texas And see what God has done If your gypsy feet are restless Not a custom Welcome to It Happened in Grand Prairie. We're bringing you number four history tape dated December the 2nd, 1985. And we have two very eloquent guests with us today, Mr. and Mrs. W. Taylor Irving. And we're so delighted to welcome you two to the show. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Irving. Thank you, how to oh, do. Wonderful to have you with us, longtime Grand Prairians very special to the history of Grand Prairie. And in order to make our tape more complete, we're going to start first with Taylor, with your permission, Louise. That's wonderful. And we would like for Taylor to bring us... About uh, <coughs> Miss Ella L. Irvin, one of Grand Prairie's early school teachers. She is a great aunt of mine, the lady that brought me to Grand Prairie. She is also one of Buckner Orphan's homes for our school teachers. And uh, after she moved, she taught school around New Hope and Mesquite. But after she moved to Grand Prairie, she was also the welcoming committee for anybody from Tennessee. She came from Washington, Tennessee as a young woman sometime in the early 18 and 80s, somewhere around 18. 1884-85, I don't know exactly the date, but uh, she was uh, an orphan girl during the Civil War, and uh, one of her hobbies here in Grand Prairie was finding, having been an orphan, finding homes for orphan girls, of which she found homes for a number. But uh, I remember her telling me some of the stories of her early days in Tennessee, particularly during the Civil War when first the Union forces and then the Southern forces were back and forth through where they lived until the country was almost devastated. Now, uh, she was uh, never married. She was an old maid and she was concentrated on the things nearest to her heart. But now, uh, she had uh, three sisters and two brothers. And before the Civil War, the sisters started coverlets to make two for every member of the family. Uh, would you um, wait just a minute, Taylor, and hold that up just a little bit longer, and let's let the camera get a, a good glimpse of that wonderful coverlet. And, and tell us uh, how that coverlet was made, would you, Taylor? Not in front of your face, young man. That's it. All right. All right. That's good. Now tell us something about the coverlet itself. Well, this is a craft brought from Scotland and Ireland. The family claimed to be Scot-Irish. Mm -hmm. That was a term used to families that moved from Scotland to North Ireland during the time there was a conflict between England and Scotland. And Scotland was always known for their woolen crafts. I see. And in their stay in North Ireland, they also picked up the Irish linen craft. Uh -huh. Now, all the material in this coverlid was grown and processed on the farm. Now, the white part here is linen. It is made from flax, and it's a plant that uh, has to be, toe has to be separated from the part that we call linen. It was a very tedious, back-breaking job. They put it in a hollowed-out log similar to a canoe and beat it to separate the toe from the linen. Well, how did they get the uh, linen woven? After they got all of this process done, did they spin the linen it, like you spin other cloth? It was spun on a little uh, spinning wheel 
powered by their foot. All right, and then how did they do the wool? The same way? Well, now the wool was, was the sheep was grown on the place. They were sheared by hand. Then it had to be washed and carded with a little hand card that worked back and forth and it rolled the wool up in little rolls about the size of my finger and some six, eight inches long. Then that was spun on a little uh, spinning wheel, the same kind, worked with their foot, and they'd feed this little string of wool in until it was consumed in this spinning process, and then they'd attach another little layer to it. And if the thread was not big enough the first time it run through, then they'd put two threads together and run it back through. All right, did they have their own looms there on the farm that they uh, used to put these together, put the threads of both the linen and the wool? I remember seeing the looms. They were made by craftsmen in the neighborhood out of uh, lumber grown on the, in the hills there is out of a hardwood and it was uh, no nails, no bolts. It was all mortised and pegged together. Mm -hmm. Now, the dye in this coverlet here, the blue is indigo. Mm -hmm. Indigo was a plant that was imported from South Carolina. Now, the indigo farms in South Carolina were rather prosperous farms. There's a great demand for it. And it was a money crop similar to cotton. I see. And during the Civil War, the uh, indigo farms were devastated. So they was not able to get any indigo after the Civil War. It leads me to believe that this was started before the Civil War when they had the indigo to die with. But by, because of the war, they couldn't get the red dye. And this red is a plant out of the hills. And it was a little disappointing. It faded. If you notice the indigo has kept, a, its, color, has kept it. its color and the red has faded a little. Likewise, but this, this one here, it was also, I think, finished after the Civil War because they couldn't do much during the Civil War. And they couldn't get the, again, they couldn't get the dye. And I was told that this was also, this green was also a plant out of the hills and it was a dark green, it was supposed to be a dark green, but it has faded. All right, now, Taylor, I'd like to ask you some questions about your time in Grand Prairie. Now, when you moved to Grand Prairie, you were what age? I was about 12 years old. About 12 years old. And tell us approximately where in Grand Prairie you lived, comparing it to the 1985 streets and measures of the city. Uh, I lived in this house, which was on which would be uh, South East Second Street, would be behind what is our hardware store, True Valley Hardware Store, and the American Legion Hall, mm -hmm. facing on Second Street. And you were 12 years old when you came here. Uh, did you enter the school system here in Grand Prairie, Texas? I sure did. Now, I, that was when I came here permanently. I uh -huh. come on a visit in 1917 and went to school here one term and went back to Tennessee and, and South Carolina. And when my parents died, then this lady, Ada L. Irvin, as she was known, mm -hmm. come, brought me back here. Brought you back here, all right. When you were in the Grand Prairie schools, even on the visit for the first time, uh, do you remember any of the uh, teachers or the principal or the superintendent? Give us those, would you, Taylor? I remember Mrs. Yeager. I remember Aunt Sadie Miller. I don't know. She was another one everybody liked, and they mm -hmm. called her Aunt Sadie. All right. Aunt Sadie was uh, the present Mr. Dewey Miller's aunt. I see. And they were an old family that moved here from uh, Mattoon, Illinois. Wonderful. And, uh, Do you remember your superintendent or the principal of your school during uh, your early days? I'm not sure. I have mm -hmm. two in mind, and I'm not sure which one was the superintendent at the time. And 
Well, were uh, you able to finish school and graduate from Grand Prairie High School? I finished school here in Grand Prairie in uh, 1930. 1930. You just happened to have a picture of the class of 1930. Would you hold that right under your chin so we won't move, lose you, but we'll also get a maybe a close-up of the class. That looks like, is that all of the school or is that just your class? I think this is just the class. Uh, that is all of the class of that's, 1930. That's the graduating class of 1930. That was a nice sized class, wasn't it? Well, now, wonderful. We now, do have a picture here of the entire school at, at that year. Oh, good. Let's, let's hold that up and let our uh, viewing yeah. audience see that. Now, that this was everybody. That's everyone at <laughs> Grand Prairie school. school, which was a 12, or it was an 11th grade school at that time, was it? Uh, 11th grade. Up yeah. through the 11th grade. Yeah, yeah. All right. Those are very good. Now, Taylor. Uh, after you graduated from Grand Prairie High School, give us a little bit of an update of what happened to you right after that. Well, that was uh, the beginning of the Depression. All right. And there wasn't anything very interesting happened along about those years. All right. Did you farm or did you have a job some other place? Well, the young people in those days, there wasn't much to do except some kind of farm work or working in a grocery store or something. So I did a little of all of it. Wonderful. And uh, I uh, worked for most of the old families around here, the Motleys and the Smiths and the Halls and from here to Cedar Hill. Wonderful. And uh, that, uh, I wasn't much of a cotton picker. So they found a good job for me otherwise. I was better at other things. <laughs> good, good. You were more productive in other and, uh, things other than cotton picking. I guess one of the things I enjoyed most was uh, would come on the head of ranching. Good. Uh, handling cattle, branding, dehorning, and uh, it is kind of rough. That, that, you know, would interest a young fellow. He'd like to test his self forget something else. All right, now how old were you when you happened to run into this beautiful lady that's sitting at your left? Well, that goes back a long way. <laughs> well, we're going to have to come out with all of it anyhow, Taylor. You might as well tell it all. 20 years old. 20 years old. I was out of school. We, when I was in school, I was too busy to be interested in girls. Mm -hmm. So when I got out of school and what a lot, a lot to do, Depression days, I got interested in the girls. In the girls, I see. <laughs> well, wonderful. Taylor, we're going to leave you for just a few minutes okay. now that you've brought us up to date. Uh, at the age of 20, when you met Louise, we just must bring Louise on and let her talk a little. I think I better add that to it before we Oh, go. let's add that to it, would you? This was Aunt Ella Irvin's home when she was no longer teaching school, but she was keeping boarders because she was forced to. There was no place in Grand Prairie for newcomers to board. And Dr. Copeland was her one of her Border? first bo boarders because of necessity. He had to have a place to live. All right, he, where is this located? This is the same house. At the same house? Yes, on 2nd Street. Wonderful. And he stayed with her until he married. Now, this picture shows Dr. Copeland and his first wife. It's, it's kind of hard to see it's so small and Adele is over here on one end and Mr. Charlie Hall another mm -hmm. early settler is in this buggy here and this is the same house that I began living in but Dr. Copeland lived with and his wife lived with her until she passed away that almost ruined Dr. Copeland she is a beautiful young woman yes. and a lot of the early men here in Grand Prairie lived with her, like Uncle John Stubbs, Tom Bacon, the Halls. Well, your aunt, your aunt was a very special lady to be a school teacher and also then to come along and run a boarding house for those that had no place to stay. Well, she was, I might say, a clearing house for all the newcomers to Grand Prairie. Wonderful. All right, Louise. He's had his chance, and we just must put you on now and let you talk a little bit about your heritage, your genealogy, uh, while you're in Grand Prairie, Texas. Would you do that for us, Louise? 
I'll be Stubbs glad. <laughs> Irwin. Louise Stubbs Irwin. <clears throat> my family started when my grandfather, Antoine Fauché, came here in 1876 and bought a farm. Mm -hmm. The You'll tell us where that was located. Yes. All right. I have the original deed that was written in longhand, and it was measured by Vera's from the uh, cedar post at one corner to a cottonwood tree at another corner and to a wagon tongue at another corner. That's How the way exciting. it is. And this is all given right here. It also states that there was a spring on the property, and Aunt Liza Robinson, who lived across the road, was permitted to come and get water out of that spring for cooking and drinking and washing, provided she did not damage it in any way. Mm -hmm. My grandfather came here from uh, Kankakee, Illinois. He was born in uh, Quebec, Canada, mm -hmm. but he came here. He lost his first wife in uh, Kankakee, and he came through in a wagon along with his daughter, who was Mrs. Agnes Shepler. Mm -hmm. Alphonse Shepler was her mm -hmm. husband's name. They each bought a farm side by side. And uh, Grandpa Fauché built a little house up on top of the hill where Central Village now stands. That's where my mother was born. Mm -hmm. But before that, my grandmother was born in Alsace, Lorraine, France. She and her mother lived in Kankakee. Apparently, they did not know Antoine Fauché, but she came here, Grandma, my grandmother came here to visit her uncle, who was Alphonse Shepler. Mm -hmm. At the time of the visit, she met Antoine. Mm -hmm. They became interested and finally fell in love and were married. And then he had the little house up on top of the hill. And at that time, the road that is now Tarrant Road, it was known as Turkey Knob. Mm -hmm. just the and he was having to pull water on a sled from the river for just all purposes other than drinking. And he thought that was a little difficult. They needed a place for drinking water. So he built a house down near the spring. And they lived there until he passed away. Would you t and tell us the approximate location of the spring and where that was, please? Yes, it, mm -hmm. uh, the spring is under the present I-30. Mm -hmm. When the toll road went through, it covered the spring. It tore the house down and it took the barn. Mm -hmm. So that is the approximate location. <clears throat> After Grandpa Fauché passed away, my grandmother in a number of years, she had two children, my mother and her brother, and she married N.T. Keith, Tom Keith. Mm -hmm. They lived on the farm until, I presume, mother being a young lady, she decided she'd rather live in town. Mm -hmm. So she de designed the house <clears throat> that they built on um, the corner of now Church Street and uh, Northeast Second. She designed this and uh, they moved to town. Mm -hmm. And that house now stands still at Northeast 2nd. It's, it's and all, just north of the present clinic there. All right, and, and it is the, now known as the Baker Home. The Baker Home, that's right. They have mm -hmm. redone it. In fact, after grandmother's death, mother, of course, inherited the property, and she and daddy made it into a, a duplex. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, after I lost my parents, I thought, I don't believe I care to have a duplex for rent property. But I kept it as long as I could, then sold it. And it pleases me very much that Gary Baker has gone in, and after he found out that my mother lived there, and I knew so much about it, he has restored that home, the floor plan and all, just like it was when I was a child growing up and when mother lived there. And it now has a Grand Prairie significant landmark and yes. it is on the tour. Yes, it surely does. That's wonderful. It surely does. My mother went to school here, of course, in the old school. And um, well, right here is the old, and she's in the middle here. 
Um, I'm sure you can. And that your mother's it, full name then was? was Matilda Emma Fauché. Matilda Emma Fauché. Yes, F A U C H E R. Everyone mm -hmm. says that French mm -hmm. spelling is just terrible. I don't know how they <laughs> spell names that way. But she uh, went to school here. And in her, I don't know just when, but she, of course, like all young people, wanted to make a little money, so she went into the milliner business mm -hmm. in Grand Prairie, right on Main Street. And the picture I have here, I have the article about how wonderful her being in business. And the hat that she is wearing is one that she made. And I'm quite sure the dress she has on is what she made. She did her sewing. Beautiful, beautiful. And this was your grandmother. No, this is my mother. This is your mother. My mother. This is, she was Matilda Fauché. All right, now, she was one of the first women in business in oh, Grand yes. Prairie, Texas, yes. was she not? Yes. Yes. Do you know of yes. anyone um, that was in a legitimate business in Grand Prairie, Texas before she was, to As your knowledge? A, a lady? Yes. I do not. Other than there school was, teachers? No, mm -hmm. no. Now, there was a lady... Uh, telephone operator, I do not know her name. Mm -hmm. I may have heard it, I do not know. But if they were trying to locate Matilda Fauché, this lady would say, oh, she's not at home. I saw her and Lillian Lacey pass. Lillian Lacey became Mrs. Charlie Hall later. Uh -huh. Says, I saw them pass a while ago. They've gone to town. So she kept up so with she everyone. Kept up with, the telephone operator kept up with everyone. They surely did. Mm -hmm. Well, we're looking for uh, early women in business, and we're glad to add this one to our list along uh, with the telephone operator. If we can find all of that good stuff, I we'll be appreciative. I do not know her name. Someone Go right ahead with your story. Uh, she went to school, as I said, here. And my father came here. I'm not exactly on the date of that. He came to visit his brother, John Stubbs, who had mm -hmm. come here earlier. He was working in a drugstore and was operating the telephone switchboard. Mm -hmm. John and Stubbs was? Yes. How wonderful. Yes. A man telephone operator. Yes. Yes. All right. And the drugstore was where the uh, downtown, on where the savings and loan is now, right on the corner. Who ran the drugstore? Is it Dr. Payne's drugstore? I believe he was there then. I could be mistaken, but I believe but he was But it was, was a drugstore. Yes, it was a drugstore. All right. And uh, I know I've heard Daddy tell about he'd be in, he said John and I would be visiting and he'd get a phone call for a uh, long distance out south of Grand Prairie. They don't have a telephone. And Daddy says I'd get on horseback and carry the message out there. Mm -hmm. And another way they had, they had a wire just from post to post. And that was the way they would contact by telephone. Well, now that your dad is in town, how did he meet your mother? He and Uncle John were standing in the doorway of the drugstore one afternoon, and Mother had been to Dallas. She came back on the interurban, crossed the tracks. She was walking toward town, and Daddy says, Who is that young lady? There were two of them. He described which one he was referring to. John says, Oh, that's Matilda Fauché. Daddy, my Daddy says, That's the woman that I am going to marry. And he had never met her. He didn't even know who she was. But Uncle John had dated her a little bit, so he introduced them, and they were married in 1912. Mm -hmm. They had a long, happy life and had some heartaches along with it like everyone else. Do you have any but, brothers or sisters, Louise? No, I do not. You are I an had, only child. I had a brother, but he passed away in 1920 when he was five years old. Mm -hmm. He had infantile paralysis. He was a complete invalid mm -hmm. all of his life. Mm -hmm. For that reason, I did not get to start to school until about 1921. Mm -hmm. But talking about Uncle John, he decided that Grand Prairie needed a paper to uh, let people know what was going on in town. So he wrote it, took it to Dallas, had it published, or printed rather. He would go to Dallas and pick the paper up and come back and deliver it on his little motorcycle. What year was this, Louise? Do you have any idea? I do not know. I do right. not know. But it was known as The Hustler. That was right. the name of the paper. The Hustler. was known as The Hustler. And that was before the Grand Prairie Texan oh, yes. or the Grand Prairie oh, yes. Daily News. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. It surely was. All right. Incidentally, this is a picture of the 
church that my mother was married, mother and daddy were married in. All right, and that was the first Methodist Church. First United Meth Methodist Church, That's but right. it was not known as United. No, 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 it was just... All right. After mother and daddy married, daddy was a... In fact, he had a degree in butter making. Mm -hmm. And creamy business was what his line of work was. And he was in uh, Quero, Texas, and in Waco. After he and mother became engaged and were married, they moved to Arkansas City, Kansas. He was going to work in the creamery there. They decided to come back to Grand Prairie, and of course, no creamery here, but he went to Fort Worth and worked for Nestle Creamery Company for quite a while. No car, he had to ride the Interurban to and from. Mm -hmm. Mother would fix his lunch, and they also, at that time, had the invalid son. Mm -hmm. So Daddy quit there and decided that he would go into business for himself. All he right. went into the plumbing business. Into the plumbing business? Yes. In Grand Prairie? In Grand Prairie. Wonderful. Was he the very first plumber in yes. Grand Prairie, to your knowledge? Yes. In fact, I have a copy of the first plumbing license that was ever issued in Grand Prairie. And it's number one. Number Plumbers one. permit number one, May the 12th, 1914. Is that no, the date or 24? 24. 1924. 1924. You can 19... see that I'm blind in my old age. <laughs> Wonderful. 1924. 1924, yes. the first plumber's permit. Mm -hmm. He okay. also did some electrical work along with that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he did not have the money to buy a car or to buy a truck. And this picture shows how my daddy did his work, his electrical work. He would walk. From, his, from their home, they had built their home on North Street, carry his tools and a wire and everything, his ladder and all, walk up into Dalworth, do the job up there, then walk back. And that's approximately four miles, isn't it? Three miles? I don't know. Approximately, it's in other words, four. from Center Street to North, at least northwest of, say, 19th Street that's, uh, in, yes. that uh -huh. in that that's area. That's about 19 blocks, isn't it? And one of the times he was doing a job there, and he thought he knew exactly, or they thought they knew what they wanted Daddy to do, but when he got to the job, they decided they wanted a three-way switch in one of the rooms. He did not take one with him. He had put one in their home. He walked back to the house on North Street, took it out of mother and daddy's home or their home, walked back up there and put the switch in and finished the job and then walked home. So that's the way my father started in, in business. All right, now Louise and our, we have a couple of minutes remaining and would you believe that we have already used about 28 minutes, but let's talk a little bit. We know your family, there's more things like that you would like to tell us, but let's get down to just you and Taylor and your children, your son, okay. and tell us a little bit about that, would you? I knew there was a red-headed football player, and that's all I knew, <clears throat> and he was captain of the team. We had never dated. He graduated before I did. I graduated in 31. He graduated in 30. And um, after I had graduated, I guess before I graduated, there was a friend that had a, her mother gave us a Valentine party. And that's where he, well, he just fat told me he loved me there. <laughs> we had never gone together. But it was about two or three months after that, he asked me for a date. And I didn't date anyone after that. Now, I don't think he did, because we married in 1935. We celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary, the 17th of October of this year. All right, and tell us and about your son. We have a son, George. He is in commercial construction in Fort Worth, his own business. He has two children. One lives with her mother in Houston. His son, W.C., lives with him. He is a junior in high school this year. He will be 17 in April. We're very proud of our offsprings. Wonderful. Louise and Taylor, it's been so delightful to have you with us. I know that we're getting near the winding down time. We must come back and talk with you all some more. So later on in this series, we'll come back and we want to talk about Mr. Tom Hall and the Southland Cemetery and the work that Taylor did there. 
the fact that you are have been forever the sweetheart of the Lions Club here in Grand Prairie, Texas, to tell a little bit about some of the things that you all have done in your later years in Grand Prairie, Texas. And this is Ruthie Jackson and reminding you that history is as we do and we want to thank you all so very much for being with us today to get us started on the... If you're in the country living